It's that time of year again to reflect upon the past year and a half or so of AVGN episodes. This is for the newest DVD. And since I'm not able to fill an entire episode with straight commentary, I don't have enough to say about any one particular episode, so I find it best to give an overall commentary of all the episodes, giving a little bit of comments on each one. That way, you get it all. I'm not sure exactly when this DVD or Blu-ray is coming out, so I'm going to talk up till the most recent episode of this time. The range I'm going to cover is from late 2014 to early 2016, from 12 Days of Shitsmiths until the Mega Man episode. The Mega Man episode was the biggest production. The rest of the episodes this time were more basic, which I know people like anyway, and even doing basic episodes in 2015 pushed the absolute limits of the time available of what was possible to produce. There's 365 days on the calendar, and all those days were used up, with Board James, Monster Madness, the Jekyll and Hyde movie trailer, James and Mike videos, movie reviews, and tons of miscellaneous videos. AVGN was just one of many things, and AVGN has always been the main focus, but now, after 130-something episodes, it was time to give something else a chance. And my heart was in Board James. It was a fresh, new passion project with a story arc, something that I really wanted to do, regardless of whether it's the most popular of my shows or not. That's what's on my brain. The point is, 2015 was the year of Board James. Board James needed to get a turn, and after it was done, I put extra time into the next AVGN, which was the Mega Man episode, the largest production of any nerd episode to date. Now let's go episode by episode, starting back to December 2014. 12 Days of Shitsmiths. The idea for this episode came about uh, sort of as a follow-up to the Wishlist episode. I ran out of Christmas games, at least ones that would work, so the holiday tradition tended to go more in the direction of let's take a bunch of random games, maybe ones that would never work as full episodes, but I still wanted to talk about them. Well, the only issue with the Wishlist episode was that lots of people forget that I reviewed Bad Dudes, Where's Waldo, or Skate or Die, because it's all generically lumped into one episode. That goes the same for the other compilations I've done, like the Christmas Carol episodes. And then for years and years and years after that, people would say, hey, you should review Shaq Fu. James already reviewed Shaq Fu. Why didn't they know that? Because the name of the episode was Christmas Carol Part 1 and Christmas Carol Part 2. So that kind of created a problem in that people were requesting a game that the nerd has already done. I'm always having conversations with Mike about what the next AVGN episode should be because a lot of times I'm stretching. I'm trying to think what would be good, what would make a good episode. And I said, how about 12 Days of Shitsmiths? 12 individual episodes, but they're all shorter episodes. Would people be happy with shorter episodes? You know what? If you go back and you watch like the one of the early episodes, like Roger Rabbit or like Karate Kid, those videos are like three minutes long. And people now expect the videos to be like 15, 20 minutes. It's like, it's crazy. The amount of effort that goes into the episodes now is so much more involved than back then. For example, the Lethal Weapon episode, that one, there's really only, the big joke of it is just when you walk off screen and then you walk back. That's a really funny, but it doesn't make enough for like a 20 minute episode. There's not enough funny things in it. Yeah, what is the length requirement of a nerd episode? I mean, hell, if you guys consider the Roger Rabbit episode and the Karate Kid episode a nerd episode, and I think we all do, well, then the, the length requirement is about three minutes. So there you go. <laughs> After those early episodes that were only a few minutes long, then James fucked himself by making the episodes better. And so people came to expect more out of the episodes. I felt a lot of pressure to make each one of these reviews worthy. And it turned out the episodes ended up being longer and more substantial than even I expected, and the total length of the 12 episodes combined exceeded an hour. A Christmas special that was over an hour long? Not bad. I had only a couple weeks to finish it all in time for the start date, 121 hours of work, making it the third most time-consuming AVGN production of that time. You know, we came up with a list of episodes for Shitsmas, and then he said to me, oh, I'm going to review Porky's for the Atari 2600. And I'm like, 
really you're gonna do porkies because uh, i was thinking to myself like what what is there to even say about that game and then he went off and he made the episode and and then i saw it and it's like this like eight to ten minute like review and it's like the fucking funniest atari 2600 review i've ever seen this one actually probably is my favorite from the shitsmith series i love that one i think it's great I was very happy with how it all turned out, especially the Universal Theme Park Adventure game. I can't believe that we found a GameCube game that's based on Back to the Future, Jaws, E.T., and Jurassic Park, and it just happened to be one of the worst games I ever played in my life. It was perfectly ripe for nerd material. So I brought it over to James and I showed it to him and I remember him looking at the front cover and being like, what the fuck is this? Like, how do you have E.T. and Back to the Future? Like, how have, how have we not played this? Next thing you know, we're, we did the James and Mike Monday video on it. And yet, yeah, lo and behold, it's a fucking terrible, terrible, hilarious game. But then we decided, you know what? This would actually make a better nerd episode than it would just a James and Mike Monday episode because... It's classic nerd material. We decided, okay, this also needs to be a nerd episode. I remember before that, people always were kind of confused in that, oh, if you do something for James and Mike Mondays, that means you can't do it for the nerd. Or if you make a nerd episode, that means you can't do it for James and Mike Mondays. Well, we've done both. We've also done the reverse in that the nerd has reviewed Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and we've done a James and Mike Monday on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So it doesn't really matter if we cover something uh, weekly Let's Play, James and Mike Monday, or, or a Bootsy video or something like that. It's two different things. Um, I think it's great because you get to see our, our you know, our real, real-time reactions to that game, and then James taking the same thing and making a scripted video off of it is another way to do it. You can get something out of, out of both, I think. Then there was the LJN Video Art, the worst drawing program, barely functional, no joke. So bad I even found out that Siskel and Ebert, the all-time famous movie critics, reviewed it once. You know, at least with Mario Paint, you make a line. It's not perfect, but at least it, it does what you're trying to do. You get the idea. This thing, you can't even, like, do anything. Like, you just try to go down. And, uh, you try to make a circle. You can't even make a circle. You try to make a square. You can't make a square. Just everything possible about it fucking sucks. Throughout 2015, I had no spare time left to search for bad games. Usually, I like to try out lots of games to audition them to see which ones would make the best episodes. But this year, I had no extra time. If any nerd episodes were going to get done at this time, I needed to pick a game and I needed to start making the episode right away. Luckily, it just so happened that lots of fans requested Hong Kong 97, and Mike also brought it to my attention. I tried it out for one minute and laughed my ass off. It was so bad, the nerd had to review it. It was almost too bad for the nerd. It was too bad. The episode says it all, but there has been one little update since then. In the episode, I mention it's an extremely rare game. This game became popular online, I think mostly with emulators. The only way I was able to play it was because somebody converted it onto a Super Nintendo cartridge. At the time I made the episode, I couldn't even find a picture of the real game on the internet. Well, now I have supposedly an actual Super Famicom cartridge. So as far as we know, this is a real copy of Hong Kong 97. Just to be clear, this was also for the Super Famicom disk drive, so apparently it exists as both a cartridge and as a disk. The Hong Kong 97 game was so bad it almost didn't even qualify as a game. So bad that it made it difficult to continue the AVGN series after that. I hit the bottom of the barrel. Where was there to go after that? It couldn't get any worse, so the only thing possible to do was to go back to basics again and find something that was more like a normal game. For years, we've wanted to do some kind of TurboGrafx-16 game, but I wasn't able to find a game that offered any good nerd material. Uh, I did a lot of work and research to find games that not only were bad, but also had something funny about them, and, um, and also were not just NES games. Um, it was really about, hey, let's hit some other consoles, some stuff that's not uh, just NES. And Darkwing Duck, um, really seemed to stand out. Um, I had done a lot of research and looked all, all over the place asking people that I know, 
Cat uh, was one of those people, and also doing uh, a lot of internet research. What is the worst TurboGrafx-16 game? And it's pretty unanimous that it is Darkwing Duck. This episode didn't do anything new. It was just your basic AVGN episode. If this episode would have come out in 2007, I would have said it was a good one. But now I was doing it more because there hadn't been an episode in a few months, and I had to get one out. And also, we wanted to check TurboGrafx-16 off the list. Um, and there are some really funny moments uh, in that video. Uh, the funniest moment in the video, I think, is, uh, is you know, the safe falling down. That part's hilarious. It wasn't a bad episode by any means. There are some parts that I really liked. I like the part where I'm reaching for the controller and the editing when I flip out and there's an explosion for no reason. That's great. But overall, it felt like the same exact thing that I've done over a hundred times. There also had never been a full standalone Dreamcast episode. So Mike brought over this game called Seaman. I had no idea what it was. Then I played it and it was unlike any game the nerd had ever reviewed before. What can we do that's different? What can we do that will bring something more entertaining to the video? Uh, that one worked out really, really well. And it's such an interesting and bizarre game. And also the gameplay of that is so different than so many other games. Um, it's not your typical, you know, crappy side scroller or... Obviously, if you've seen the episode, there's a weird fish creature that you talk to through the controller's microphone and it responds back to you. This was an extremely hard game to record because it's not meant to be played in one sitting. You're supposed to come back to it daily, only for brief moments. Even though I was able to cheat it by fast-forwarding the clock on the Dreamcast, it still took a very, very long time to get all the footage I needed. Especially when I fucked up one part and had to redo half the game. It was the most time I spent on the gameplay portion of any AVGN episode. This was in the middle of the summer when I do a lot of traveling, so I wrote the script in many different time zones. With how crazy my summer schedule is always, it took me a few months to finish this episode, and it turned out to be my best episode of 2015 by far. I thought it was a great idea to turn it into a story, almost a science fiction plot about artificial intelligence taking over, like the Terminator. In this case, the Sega becomes self-aware and tries to take over humanity. And in the twist ending, I am the one behind the fish glass. Sort of like Jim Carrey in The Truman Show. Almost like the audience are the seaman on the other side and you've been watching me grow up. And then it flashes back through the timeline where you see how the nerd progressed over the years. Just like how in the game you watch the seaman progress. It was a thank you to the fans. A thank you for watching me all these years and for helping me to grow. The Crow was the first time I ever did a standalone episode on a Sega Saturn game, another console off the checklist. This was the mandatory Halloween episode, but more specifically, it was actually a Mischief Night episode. So again, uh, m moving on, a lot of times the, the nerd will review games based on movies. And a reason a lot of the uh, game choices are movie choices is because, for one thing, James is a movie guy, huge movie fan. Another reason is it's easier, I guess, to make uh, funny videos off of something based on a movie because then you have... Um, more, um, how should I say, like established jokes and things that can be made or more comedy that can come out of something. I rewatched the movie The Crow and then I realized the game wasn't based on The Crow. It was based on the sequel. So then I realized, look, don't worry about the movie. Just make a good episode. Well, I had to finish this episode in less than 24 hours. It was that quick. I was in the middle of working on many projects all at the same time, so getting an episode in time for Halloween was a miracle. I think of this one as another average episode, but considering the time crunch, it's pretty good. At the time, I was finishing up the Board James 13 Dead End Drive episode, and previously that year, Board James and the Nerd became fused into the same character where it's like somebody with a Jekyll and Hyde split personality disorder. So it made sense to end with a cliffhanger and lead into the next Board James episode. Next was bad video game cover art. 
This was a series of 25 videos because I figured the only way to top 12 days of shitsmiths was a whole advent calendar, one video a day all the way up to Christmas. We had we did 12 of those. We'd have to do 25 of them, which is more than double. Um, so it just wasn't a feasible thing to do that many game reviews. I knew that was absolutely impossible unless I had half the year to start on it. Here I am, just finished the Halloween episode, just finished the Jekyll and Hyde movie trailer, just finished the AVGN Volume X Blu-ray, just finished the Board James Nightmare finale. Now it's the very beginning of December. Whatever I'm doing, it needs to get done fast. Well, instead of making them full game reviews, I decided, how about do something that I've never done before? Critique the cover art. There was like the Eliminator boat duel with like this, that shitty cover. Well, they were all shitty covers, but I'm just trying to like, now I'm just picturing the covers in my, oh, there was the Commodore 64 cock in game. Cock in. Like really? It might have been a little easier than if I were reviewing games, but it was still not easy at all. It was a lot of fun, don't get me wrong, but I had to lose a lot of sleep in order to get it done. The hardest part was the images of the game covers because there were so many layers on my editing timeline that the system kept crashing constantly. And I love the way uh, James did that as an art critic. Uh, so it was, it was a weir this weird sort of um, Christmas art critic thing. I went to an art college, I have a bachelor degree in fine arts, and I never use it. So this was a chance not to critique art in a serious way. Uh, I feel this was more of a big in-joke for myself and any other art students who sat through so many art lectures and looking for meaning, always trying to read into things too deeply. So it was kind of like making fun of art school. That's my background and that is my upbringing. I didn't count these as episodes. I considered this a big bonus thing, which led up to the mandatory Christmas episode. So yes, on top of all that, I still delivered a Christmas episode, and that was Mortal Kombat Mythology's Sub-Zero. I had mentioned to James, why not review like Mortal Kombat on Game Boy or something like that? Because the Game Boy vo version of Mortal Kombat is so crappy compared to playing it on in the arcade or on a console and James's response to that was well of course it is it's on Game Boy it's obviously not going to be as good because it's on a handheld limited system it's it's not really fair to complain about you know the Game Boy games now where it would be fair I think is if it was a unique Game Boy game if it, if it was a game that wasn't on a console if it was a game that wasn't in the arcade if it was just a Game Boy game and it was bad, then I think the nerd could review it. It was strange to find such a flawed Mortal Kombat game on a 64-bit console. I haven't done many Nintendo 64 reviews, so it was a good choice. I don't have much to say about that one. The review speaks for itself. The way you have to turn around in the game, it's just like very broken. Again, this episode had to be done quickly. It was another basic episode. It did nothing new, but landing on top of the whole bad game cover art advent calendar, I think it was a welcome addition to round out the holiday season. After doing so many basic episodes, I think it was about time to make a really epic one with a storyline. With Board James done, I was finally able to devote the extra time needed to make a really good AVGN episode. This became the Mega Man Games episode. This was the first episode of 2016, and we knew a major anniversary in nerd history was approaching. We already celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the first pilot episode of the nerd. Now it was going to be the 10-year anniversary of the creation of the YouTube channel. It had to be something special. Since I had so many Mega Man games to work with, I decided each one should be reviewed by a different nerd in four separate time periods. So the present day nerd travels back in time to visit the past nerds. What greater way to take you back to the past than to actually go back to the past literally and to relive the older episodes. The nerd quits and takes off his traditional shirt and it's like a superhero story, kind of. Like Superman, Spider-Man, they've all had their chapters in their careers where they lose their powers or they give them up to pursue a normal life or whatever. And then duty calls and they have to return to save the day, more fresh and better than ever. 
the different time periods were broken up by the different nerd sets. Now I didn't have access to any of my old homes anymore, so it was a challenge to work with the old footage and to use lots of green screen. I had to go back to the original mini DV tapes, scan through hours of raw footage and find empty backgrounds of all those old shots and sometimes create them by photoshopping the nerd out of the shots. There was no one episode that had all the angles I needed. I had to take combinations of shots from all different episodes to create one environment. Because of that, there were lots of continuity issues. One moment the nerd's supposed to be playing a PlayStation game, and next moment he's holding a Super Nintendo controller. I had to find two precious seconds where my hands were covering it so you couldn't tell. This shot in particular took almost an entire day, in post only. There were shirts hanging in the background that needed to be photoshopped out. I had to trace around the nerd and create moving mats to separate the footage into different layers. It was a great challenge, but I loved how it seemed like I was actually interacting with the old scenes. And when he throws the disc, then the, the, the disc now hits him in the head. There was no way to take that old footage and interact other than doing something like that. Perfect choice by James to do that, I thought. The nerd could have went back to any point in time, but he goes back into a dream. You know, it's, it's like, it's hilarious. And it's also the most confusing point in the dream because now there's five different nerds um, it's very, the whole thing is very creative and I know that back then I remember him talking about how difficult that was then to film four of him sitting on that couch back then. Now to go back and go back to that footage and add in himself now and, and to do it again but to work with the old footage. How about angry video game nerd? Yeah, that, yeah. that's good. But it's the creation of the of the name, Angry Video Game Nerd. Great, great moment, and I think that, that those moments really are what celebrate the entire uh, series. And um, it really, just that's a perfect moment. Almost any shot where there were multiple nerds had to be reshot more than once because I was never looking in the right place. You would never imagine how hard it was to match up the positions so that it looked natural. Also, whenever I'm talking to myself in the same shot, I have to remember to leave a pause for the other nerd's dialogue. Sometimes the pause would be too brief, other times it would be too long. Everything had to be reshot, I had to keep going back and refilming things all the time. When working on a movie, you have a crew of people working on something like this. Guess what? James did it by himself. No other people involved. So I think it's pretty fucking impressive that James arranged that whole scene and did it all himself. Also, each nerd had different glasses. I was lucky to still have all the old glasses, but they were all my real glasses and my prescription has changed over the years, so I can no longer see through any of the old nerd glasses. So while I was filming, I was constantly switching all these different glasses and it really fucked with my eyes. Any shot that could be done practical instead of digital, I went for practical. I was always changing the technique to keep you from catching on to any one trick. The part where I go back to 2004, I found a closet door that looked like the one I had in my old bedroom. I only used a digital effect when it was necessary to interact with the old footage. But then James comes up behind him and he's makes, making this face kind of like, you know, coming up. It's really fucking funny. And then, and then he leans in. He's like, you know, I'm dead fucking serious. He's like leaning in like that. And the, but then the camera cuts, and you see who he's talking to. Cause it's like, yeah, who is the nerd talking to? Now, th throughout this ten year span, it always seemed like the nerd was probably talking to the audience, right? But really, you find out the nerd wasn't talking to an audience. He was just in a, in a room by himself, alone. He was talking to a fucking teddy bear. That tells you something about the nerd. Maybe the nerd has psychological problems. Mike used to always perform as guest characters in the episodes. It was a long time since we've done that, and it was sort of an old AVGN tradition. I thought it was about time, so we got Mike in an episode again. Of all the classic characters, it seemed like it was time to bring back Bugs Bunny, even for only a brief scene. Okay, so the nerd leaves for a little while, and then Bugs Bunny comes in, and, and like he just takes over. Like, what the? Like, who is he? 
Like, wh- wh- who does he think he is to just come into somebody's house whenever he wants and just and just take everything over? Like, he that's breaking and entering. Bugs Bunny broke in and entered. Like, he should be arrested. <laughs> like, seriously. So, better than being arrested, beat the fucking shit out of him. It's just, how many times are we gonna fucking... <laughs> how many times are we, is Bugs Bunny gonna fucking come back and have to get his ass handed to him? I knew that we would never top the Crazy Castle episode. That fight had the spitting blood, the couch breaking, the pie in the face, Bugs getting his head ripped off and turning into Woody Woodpecker. We always thought that would be the final Bugs Bunny fight, but now here we are again. It had to have something new, so we figured for one thing, let's put Bugs Bunny through the ceiling. We put uh, the Bugs Bunny costume onto a dummy, the same dummy that was used in the AVGN uh, movie. That that dummy has gone off of a fucking Vasquez Rocks where Captain Kirk fought the fucking Gorn. That's crazy. That dummy was on Vasquez Rocks where, and he went through the ceiling of the, that's, the, that's fucking crazy. When we put the Bugs Bunny costume on the dummy, we forgot that Bugs was wearing the nerd shirt. So it was a continuity error. So when we go to put Bugs Bunny through the roof, we forgot to put the fucking nerd shirt on. It was just Bugs Bunny. So we had to do that twice actually where he went through the roof. We had to reshoot the ceiling break. We, we only had one extra ceiling tile and it was meant to be one take. So we had to repair the tile and shoot it a second time. And so, so that's cool. I was glad to see that we were able to do something different. I'm glad that we did the extra, put in the extra work to do that. Cause now looking at the video, it's like, oh, there's something you don't see in the Crazy Castle video. There's something you don't see in the Bugs Bunny's birthday blowout video going through the ceiling. So I, I like that moment. But the big moment was when Nerd punches Bugs through the wall. I always wanted to do something like that. I'm a big fan of breakaway scenery. So we got Kyle Justin, who always helps behind the scenes these days. He built me a fake wall to look just like the one in the nerd room. First, we filmed the real wall. Then we took all the games off the shelves and put them on the fake wall using pictures to match the continuity. Every game had to go on the shelf in the same order, or at least close enough so that it didn't look like a totally different wall. The shelves were made of styrofoam, so styrofoam bends. The next thing we had to do was we had to take all the games out of each fucking case. So we're opening Sega Genesis cases, taking the games out one by one, that's one, filled up the an entire wall with empty game boxes, okay, so that they were light enough so that it didn't break the styrofoam on the wall. Even then, the the game boxes, the empty game boxes on their own were still too heavy and they were going to break the styrofoam. So then we had to create supports for the um for the styrofoam uh you know shelves so that so that it wouldn't all collapse. We also had to do this all very quickly because we were on a time crunch. We have all these cameras going. I'm standing there in the Bugs Bunny costume. James says, now the original idea is I'm supposed to go through the wall. One take. So James says, all right, you ready, Mike? Ready, three, two, one, go! Wall doesn't fucking break. Bam, I did it again. And second time still didn't break. And then now I'm getting pissed. I'm in the suit. I've done this twice now. And I'm upset because I felt like I failed. I I can get, it doesn't hurt or anything. I can can get through it. Third time, I'm like, all right, I don't care what this fucking takes. I'm going through the fucking wall. Ready, Mike? Yep. And go. I gave it my all. And that's the time when I actually went through the wall. And I actually think, um, I'm glad that it happened that way. I actually think it turned out for the better because had I gone through on the first time, you would have really only gotten that one end shot where I go through the wall. By doing it multiple hits, you get three, like three different shots of me getting whacked into the fucking wall. Lots of people wondered if any of the games were damaged. That was what I was wondering too, but luckily none of them did. It was carefully thought out, even before, on the real wall, to place all the Sega Genesis games more in the middle because those are more durable, and that was the area he was going to hit. My first thought was to print out fake boxes, 
but that could have added weeks to an already impossible schedule. Another bucket list idea I had was to jump through a window. I always wanted to end a nerd episode with me freaking out and then jumping out the window like the cowardly lion from Wizard of Oz. Kyle built a fake wall for the exterior shot. The plan was to drop a dummy from the warehouse ceiling and then have it crash through the glass. The camera was tilted sideways so it would look like the dummy was traveling horizontally rather than vertically. I've learned time and time again that nothing ever breaks the first time. Kyle and I spent days discussing this. How can we make sure the glass breaks but doesn't break prematurely? I had to fill the dummy's head with sand so that it was heavier, glued the glasses to the face, sewed the pocket pouch on there. Every detail of the nerd was on the dummy. Then we go to drop it off and of course the glass wouldn't break. Okay, go. Ah, oh, shit. Shit. It won't fucking break. <laughs> Finally, it worked, and it was awesome. Yes! I mean, it looked like uh, like there was like an assault, like something bad was happening. <laughs> it was like, blam. I don't see like the slow motion wasn't <laughs> slow enough. This was the most time-consuming nerd episode of all time, with the amount of work clocking in at over 138 hours. Even if it was just a basic game review of all those Mega Man games, even that was a huge undertaking. But with all the effects and filming multiple nerds, keeping in mind anytime there's two nerds, that's twice as much shooting, let alone five nerds. I had only one month with limited available days and inside that month to finish it all. I was not sleeping. But after it was all done, I think it was one of the best nerd episodes ever, if not the best. Uh, really well scripted. I think it was a great celebration uh, of the 10-year uh, anniversary. I think the Angry Video Game Nerd would have never gotten popular if it was just game review, game review, game review with an end rant. Um, it had to break it up and do different things. So to kind of get back to that and do something more elaborate with characters and plot and script, uh, I think it's, it's necessary to do that every once in a while. The other type of episode, which is more your standard game review, where the nerd goes in depth in a game. So there's just dif different types of episodes. And a lot of times I feel like the best humor comes out of James's commentary and witty, clever things that he says about the games. I've never seen anybody else do game reviews and, and do them quite that well. A lot of times people are very bland. I think I can be bland. I think most people do game reviews very bland, but the way James does it is very entertaining. It makes you look at video games in a way that you wouldn't otherwise look at them, um, and it makes you think about them a little bit deeper. and. Um, his commentary and the scripts, basically the points that he brings out in the game reviews are, is something that only James, I, I've only seen James do, and I don't know quite how to describe it, uh, but I think that everybody who's listening to me knows what I'm talking about, because I think that, that is what made the Nerd series over all these years so popular. There's nothing quite like uh, hearing James critique a game. <laughs>